to the porch. I'm Richard Grund. This is where we get back to basics, the red letter basics. By examining the Word of God and focusing on the Book of Acts Church, we see how the early church served the Lord. The Porch Online Bible Study takes a deeper look into their service to the kingdom of God. Our desire has always been to find and restore the priesthood of the believer and regain its world-shaking influence. By delving deeper into Scripture, we find the church the Lord intended and not the one man created. The church age is not over, and what took place in the upper room is as much for today as it was on the day of Pentecost. If you know that there's more to your spiritual walk with Yeshua, with Jesus, and you want more, then you're welcome to join us on this journey. If you have any questions, go to firefalltalkradio.com, use the contact button, or you can email us at the porch, lowercase, one word, at firefalltalkradio.com. If you'd like to support us, and we hope that you do, uh, firefalltalkradio.com made page, there are ways to do that. We appreciate your support and encouragement. Welcome to all of our listeners from the various streaming platforms. Speaking of which, updates have been made to the website with links to all of the streaming sources for Firefall Talk Radio. If you don't know where to find them and you don't want to download the app for Spreaker or whoever, the the Apple Podcast app is there, Google Podcasts, Spreaker, uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Blog Talk, it's all there. Remember, if you need prayer, or you want to pray for others in the porch community, contact us. Remember, we care about you. Um, Beside the newsletter, which I'm still working on, going to create a prayer email list. Got a couple of prayer requests for people. I'm going to send them out to you. If you're already on the list, be on the lookout. If you're not and would like to be, let us know. Make sure you subscribe to us wherever you listen to us, as well as on social media. Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We start out with praise reports and prayer requests. Of course, I praise the Lord for my salvation. Without that, I'm not here. I have no hope in what is becoming a hopeless time. He gave me back my family, which I threw away. So I am thankful for my wife, son, daughter-in-laws, grandson, furry kids. Everything I have is because of that day on October 9th of 1988, when I made him Lord of my life. I am thankful for my salvation. I'm thankful for him calling me to work in the family business. Growing up in New York and being Italian, the family the family business meant other things, but this is the family business I want to be in. Preaching, teaching, setting the captives free, destroying the works of the enemy, I am thankful for that. For everything I have, the technology, this home, all that he's given me, I am abundantly blessed and highly favored. I pray for all the things I mentioned before, for God to protect them, bless them, inspire them, uplift them. I pray for you to be saved, healed, and delivered if you're not, for you to find your walk with the Lord, to find your place in the kingdom. I pray for Israel, for Jerusalem. I pray for America. Oh, boy, do I pray for America. We really need the Lord right now. We're going to talk about that tonight. Pray over this technology. I pray the Lord would bless it, that the Spirit would flow, that we would be made whole, that we would be divinely whole so that we can do everything he needs us to do. Return back to our divine design. To not live a life of brokenness and hurt and pain. To begin to believe that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That he can heal you right now where you sit. So in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, be healed. Let the Holy Spirit envelop you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Father, I just thank you. Holy Spirit, have your way, and Lord, I pray that not only would you be glorified, but we would feel your presence, and we would be revived. 
in Yeshua's name. Amen. These lessons are proprietary information, except where noted the information comes from outside sources. The combination of that information, the matter presented, is exclusive, cannot be repeated or used without permission. The date of this broadcast serves as the registered date of the following information. I apologize for my raspy voice, but we're in the middle of very early spring and pollen everywhere and flowers blooming, and I'm paying the price for it. But your Bible should be open. If you do it on your phone or your iPad or your tablet or your laptop, that's great. But get a tangible Bible. And if you don't know which one to get, reach out. used to be that the porch had a section on Amazon where you could buy books and we would benefit from it. I'm going to look back into that. If you're interested, start posting links of some suggested books to read, Bibles to buy. But if you can't afford one, you let us know and we'll send you one. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the calling of God. And that we should live entirely submissive to the will of God. He is the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. That's the theme. Called, chosen, and faithful. Are you with him? Will you answer the call? Well, if not, God will send a different message of invitation. Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I will dwell in the high holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. We're talking about revival. It's something true believers desire. Psalm 85 verse 6, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? You know, if the fire has gone out, you don't have that same zeal that you had when you first got saved. Well, you need him to fan the flames. You need him to revive that fire. Psalm 138, verse 7, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you, capital Y, meaning the Lord, will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The fire of his Spirit stirs up the fire within us. That's what Paul is saying to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 6. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. That Greek phrase for stir up means to revive. Revive the fire. Revive the gift. Every now and then we need to be reminded of that. I'm going to read you some news reports here from Georgetown News Graphic, Kentucky. The Georgetown News Graphic, Kentucky. Revival broke out on the campus of Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky, Wednesday, February 8th, after a routine chapel service. University President David Kevin Brown said the revival began organically and people from the area churches, other universities, and the community kept coming. People all over the country are traveling to Wilmore. According to posts from Sarah Thomas Baldwin, students from universities like Eastern Kentucky, University of Kentucky, Mount Vernon, OSU, Campbellsville, Lee, Anderson, Purdue, Spring Armor, Georgetown, Midway, Regent, and more have stopped by to see and be a part of the revival. But this happened in 1970 when revival broke out during a chapel service after the then academic dean, Custer B. Reynolds, decided, instead of preaching his prepared message, to let students present testimonies 
And according to a documentary on the university website, that revival lasted seven days. Classes resumed on February 10th, but the Hughes Auditorium remained open for prayer. The 1970 revival consisted of 144 hours of nonstop worship. Asbury University is a private Christian university in Wilmore, Kentucky. And although it's a non-denominational school, it is aligned with the Wesleyan holiness movement. But the audience has come from all over. And it has spilled over into the chapel in the Asbury Theological Seminary. From CBN News, the Asbury Collegian reports that during a call to confession last Wednesday, February 8th, at least 100 people fell to their knees and bowed at the altar. Since then, it has turned into a Holy Spirit outpouring that shows no signs of stopping. The Holy Spirit was tangible in the room, says Anna Lee White, a student at the University of Kentucky, a member at Emanuel Baptist Church, she told Kentucky today. Chains were broken, confession happened, and God was praised as holy, holy, holy. In Kentucky today, so the pastor of West Broadway Baptist Church and a professor at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Tim Bjor, Bjor, I just mangled your name, Tim, forgive me. He said, I like the old dictum, how do you tell if it's really a work of God? It's not how high you jump, it's how straight you walk when you land. It's the fruit that comes from it. Some people are critical and may say it's just emotionalism. Certainly emotion is involved. But it's also genuine life change, repentance, and confession of sin. He goes on, Jonathan Edwards said, Revival seems to spread on the wings of testimony. Testimony from those who have been revived, testifying to the works of grace, it seems to ignite a spark in other individuals as well. Remember, we've talked about that for all the time here on the porch. Tell people what the Lord has done for you. That's what stirs them. Jonathan Edwards said that emotion is there. It doesn't really mean anything. But he identified five works that indicate a genuine work of God. And the five are, number one, Yeshua, Jesus, is honored. Number two. Satan's kingdom is opposed through repentance. Best way to plunder his kingdom is to get people saved, healed, and delivered and have them repent of their sins. God's word is highly regarded. Number four, God's truth is revealed. And number five, God and others are loved. And one of the prevailing things I see from all the reports is the, the love that people have felt and are experiencing. But see, this is proof of John fifteen twenty six, Yeshua said when the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the standby comes whom I will send to you from the Father. That is the spirit of truth who comes from the Father. He will testify and bear witness about me. The Holy Spirit brings the Lord to the for forefront, no one else, no man, no woman, no denomination, no organization. He brings the Lord to the front. Lee Grady, who used to be a writer for Charisma Magazine on Twitter, said, the fire is spreading. Reports say students from more than 21 colleges have now arrived at Asbury University in Kentucky for revival services. Just imagine what will happen if this spreads nationwide. Well, how about an eyewitness account from a young man named Ben Bland who posted this on Facebook, and I hope I'm okay with this, Ben. I didn't get your response in time, but if it's a problem, I'll take it down, but I want to share it. Jesus has jumped all over me tonight. I'm an apostolic Pentecostal, and I've just witnessed something that I've never experienced before in my life, complete freedom in worship. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, and I've just experienced something that has changed me. 
I'm used to three songs, two testimonies, a sermon, and we're out the door at the Mexican restaurant before you can say, Hello, Dolly. And I don't mean that a bad way, but so many times as Christians, we rush through our services and we miss out on no telling what. Tonight, I sit in a revival at 1030 at night, and it's packed out, and there's no end in sight. There are three chapels on this campus, and they are packed out, too. The balconies and the front steps are packed out with people seeking God. The front lawn is packed. It's insane, and people are still pouring in. There are no professional singers, he goes on, no piano players. They just told that if someone felt led, they got up and sing, sang. There's complete peace and order to it all. See, that's the Holy Spirit. People are singing to the top of their lungs. Good singers and bad singers all singing together without the fear of who can sing better. Everyone is singing. It's so beautiful. People are bawling. People are hollering. People are clapping. People are jumping. People are down on the floor praying, seeking the face of God. There's no end to the praise and the repentance. I've never seen so many open Bibles and so much sincerity in all my life. I could feel a hunger that I've never felt before. There's no order to the service. It just keeps going and going. No one wants to leave. A man, a preacher kind of guy, an ex-Jew, he told he was, he, he happened to guess an ex-Jew, he told us he was, stood up and said to the congregation, what is happening? It's Jesus, he said. There's no program. There's no one telling anyone what to do. See, the Holy Spirit can do that. People are literally just standing and feeling. After the presence of God, it goes from a hush to a roar. The altar is open at all times. You can pray at any time, and someone will pray with you. There's nothing rushed. They're waiting on the Lord. It's amazing. I love this last part that I'm going to share. Asbury said, if you're here and you need a place to sleep, they will find you a place to stay. There are literally thousands of people, and they're helping people with whatever they need. Upper room, book of Acts, Solomon's porch kind of stuff there, folks. said, I experienced the love of God tonight. It's powerful. It made me think about everything in my life. The last report is from a pastor in Minnesota who was watching it online. I could take off right now. If you haven't heard about this yet, I want to tell you that God is up to something right now in America. A revival has broken out in Kentucky. A revival for the first time in decades in the United States. Not a planned revival that a local church happened to, to schedule for two months from now, but real revival. On Wednesday, February 8th, a speaker at a chapel service in Asbury University gave a powerful message from God's Word about love and repentance. Many students were deeply affected by it. He says about, about 30 students kept the meeting going after its scheduled end time, and from there, the Lord moved mightily. More and more students came back to the service. And by ma by nightfall, the massive auditorium was packed. The meeting has now continued literally without stopping at the point he wrote this for four and a half days. I just checked the live stream. There's not an open seat in the place. People are literally standing in the hallways, out the door, trying to get in. I've read incredible first-hand reports of testimonies of people getting saved and touched by God. A local professor spoke of how he walked over to check, check out what was happening. And for the first 10 minutes, he was so struck by the presence of God that he wasn't even sure what was happening. But he felt that he could stay there for the rest of his life. I've spent much of the last three years reading a lot of books on revivals, and I can tell you one thing. This is what they look like. The service is simple. No flashing lights, no gimmicks, just testimonies, God's Word, prayer, and worship. They don't even have a band playing right now. Someone just starts singing a song, and the people worship. Word has it that it's begun to spread to local college campuses as well. Pray for God to move. 
We need him. Amen, brother. We need him. I've studied revival, if you know, if you've been with us since 2010. I did a whole series on the Great Awakenings. This is what revival looks like. No smoke and mirrors, no manipulation, no plans of man, just the Holy Spirit doing what he wants. Whether it was the Wales Revival or Azusa Street or any of the other ones, it's not bent, based upon a person. It's based upon the one and only King of Kings and Lord of Lords and His Holy Spirit. The church has experienced times of religious revival in their histories. The first one was in the upper room. That's the model and example we should always look to. But they're called awakenings. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says the word awake, to awaken, to arouse from sleep. It's ordinary terms for awakening from a natural slumber like Jacob at Bethel in Genesis 28 or Yeshua in that storm tossed boat in Luke 8, 24. Used as a figure, it's the striking effect of awakening from a mental, moral, and spiritual sleep. Yeah, well, guess what, folks? America needs to awake from a mental, moral, and spiritual sleep. Because you want to know why? Because the church has been asleep. And it's amazing how the enemy has used the youth to destroy this country over the last four, five, six, seven, eight years, whatever it's been, maybe more. And he's going to use the youth to respond to it. See, he waited for the church to do something. He waited for us to stand up and respond. Now he's done it himself. He's done it in other times. Historians and theologians identify three or four waves of increased religious enthusiasms, outpourings, for as far back as the 18th century all the way up into the 20th century. Maybe we're on the verge of another one. At a time when the darkness is growing, he's starting a fire. Little bonfires all over in all of these chapels and all of these universities and all of these places. Who knows, maybe it'll go into the storefronts and other places where man is not in charge, where schedules don't matter. But when we use the term Christian revival, and I'm not a a fan of the term, unless you're willing to admit if you revive something, you're admitting that it's dead. It's referring to a specific period of increased spiritual interest or the renewal of a life of a church or a congregation or many churches or groups of people, whether regionally or globally. And this isn't like, hey, we're going to have a revival July through the week of the 4th and we're going to do it for about 10 days, and we're going to have cookout. No, no, that's not what this is. Not a planned series of meetings. Those aren't revivals. Come on. Let's stop the religious nonsense. This is where people, even non-believers, come into the presence of God, and they get struck down, and they, they get up, and they they want to be saved. They want to know him. All of the great revivals, Wales, Azusa Street, all of the ones changed the community that they were in. One of the, I think the pastor of that church or one of the chaplains of the university said the true measure of this will be these youth and people taking it out and setting fires. Because in 1970 when they had their revival, that's exactly what happened. They didn't just stay there. They took it to other schools, and they took it to other churches, and they took it out, and the fire kept going. And as long as a fire burns, it can't go out. You can set things on fire. People are looking for a fervent relationship with their Abba Father. And what's amazing about the Great Awakenings, which it's been about a decade that I taught them, about six weeks over over six weeks, 
You had the widespread revivals. They were led predominantly by evangelical Protestant ministers. We had a sharp increase for a short period of time in religion. I did the finger thing. Religion, a proud sense of conviction and redemption upon those who were affected, a jump in in church membership, um, and then a formation of new religious movements and denominations, and man got his hand on it, and people stood at the forefront, and they got up on a stage, and guess what? It went out. That sound familiar? Well, the church experienced that. It took the enemy almost 300 years to put out the fire, but he put it out. The Spirit will always begin it, and then man will take it over, and it'll die off. And the reason for that is man, and I say man generically, not male or female. They lose their humility. They forget who it's really all about, and they believe that they have something to do with it. Psalm 69, verses 29 through 32. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. I will praise the name of God with a song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bull, which has horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad. And you who seek God, your hearts shall live. Start it with a song. I don't think I shared this last week, but there was a couple of days where I got up and just a simple little church song, actually, that I learned way back at a summer camp that I went to, a Baptist summer camp. Yes, New York Italian at the time, Roman Catholic, went to a summer camp run by a Baptist preacher, and the seed got planted. And you know, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I would do the chorus part too. And I just did that every morning. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. That's not just a Sunday song. It's an everyday song. Begin to sing it over yourself. Watch your attitude change because I mind it. We need to stir up the flames. We need to stir things up. We need to sing a song to the Lord. doesn't matter if you're off key. doesn't matter if you know the words. Don't make up the words. When I don't know the words, I just hum. I make sounds. Make a joyful noise. The New Unger's Bible Dictionary said the word revive in the Hebrew, hayah, to live is used to signify being made alive, to be comforted or refreshed. The King James Version uses the word quicken. I like that word, quicken. Quicken my mortal body. Revive it to flourish or blossom again, to live again, to regain life. Now, I've shared my testimony. I've, t- I've told you it. I've had a couple of people recently ask me, for a more detailed testimony, and I'm praying about it. Um, But I was dead. I was dead in my sins. I was dead in my life. I was dead from the inside out. I was a zombie. That's what I was. I was literally the walking dead. Oh, my heart was beating. My eyes worked. My lungs worked. But my soul was not working. Restore us, O God of hosts. Cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. Psalm 80, verse 7. Throughout history, we talked about a revival in Nineveh a couple of weeks ago with Jonah. Throughout history, God has sent his word through a prophet or teacher, a preacher, a donkey, whatever. He has changed an atmosphere. He has changed a society. He has changed a person with a word. On Mount Carmel with Elijah. 
Also in Psalm 80, starting verse 17, They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man who you've made strong for yourself. Then we will not turn back from you. Revive us, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. That's the theme. We shall be saved as salvation. Being saved, Yeshua means salvation. Jesus, which is the what the you know English version of Yeshua is, from the Greek Yesos to Jesus. Salvation. Cry out to the Lord for to be saved. Cry out His name. America needs to do that. The church needs to do that. Psalm 119, verse 37. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. I think I shared with you last week, the week before, that I know we have responsibility and cares in this world, but I resent when this world intrudes upon my time with the Lord. I resent when this world and life and everything intrudes upon my fellowship with Him. So many worthless things we put our eyes on. I pray specifically starting today because... Lord and I had a meeting. I went into the meeting. He sat me down and uh, said some stuff. I won't share everything he said, but time to get serious. Time to stop being distracted. Psalm 143, verse 11. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake, for your righteousness' sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. The thing about the cry for revival, it's a sign that we know better. That we know we are the problem. And that we know he's the only answer to that problem. You see that pretty clearly. The story about the prodigal son. When he realized what he had done. And he came to his senses, Luke 15, picking it up at verse 20. And he arose, and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So he just wanted to be a servant. But the father said to his servant, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring out the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to be merry. The prodigal son was revived through repentance, through realizing he messed up and going home to his father. See, we know better, especially those of us who claim to be born again, to be believers in Yeshua and followers. We know better. And the enemy knows that we know better. And that's why they go out of their way to trip us up and make us look bad and, and inspire us to make decisions that, indicate we should know better. We know that we're the problem. I've met some people, they want to blame it on the devil, and they want to blame it on this, and they want to blame it on that. And sometimes in tough love, I have to explain to them that illustration. You're pointing your finger at something, three fingers are pointing back at you. You're three times more likely to be the problem. Actually, in some cases, it's ten times more likely. We start with us. Those people that broke down in Asbury and all the other places that it's happening, 
the repenting, the realizing I'm not living the life I'm supposed to be living. I've been fooled. I've been tricked. And they're crying out to God. We see, but this began in the upper room. That's the pattern. That's the example, especially for us here on the porch. The upper room, the empty tomb, the book of Acts church, that's our model. And although I'm not into buildings, I wouldn't mind having a storefront or a place to come together or even better. And you can pray for this. Having the ability to travel to various places, town to town, setting up shop, renting a room somewhere or whatever, and having fellowship with you. Acts 1, starting verse 8. And being assembled together with them, he, being the Lord, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. He could have said, I'm going to set you on fire. and We're going to turn this world upside down, but... He didn't, so they came together, and that instead of not saying anything, they wanted to know about restoring the kingdom to Israel. Come on, guys. We're talking about the kingdom of God, but his answer was, it's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put into his own authority, but you shall receive power, dunamis, dynamic, explosive power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Ju- all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's what revival does. Turns you into a witness. Set you on fire. So people look at you and go, huh, that person's on fire. Why are you on fire? And you get to tell them. See, they were in the upper room. It was an incubator for the seed of the church to be awakened because we know what happened next. When the day of Pentecost had fully come and they were all with one accord in one place, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and marveled, which people do when this kind of revival happens, saying to one another, look, are are not all these speak Galilean? How is it that we hear them in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Persia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. They weren't just saying nothing. They weren't doing gibberish. These people were hearing them praise the living God. So they were all amazed. And perplexed, saying to one another, "What, whatever could this mean? And then others began to mock them and say, oh, they're full of new wine. They're drunk. And now Peter, this is a different Peter. This isn't the Peter that went into the upper room. This is the one that came out of the upper room. He stands up with the eleven and he raises his voice loud enough for everybody to hear him. He says, men of Judea and all dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, 
since it's only the third hour of the day. It's only 9 a.m. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will send revival. No, this wasn't what he said, but what he said was that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Joel was prophesying about the day of Pentecost to the day of judgment. And that got started that day. The final countdown to judgment began on Pentecost. Peter goes on, men of Israel, hear these words. Yeshua of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God you have taken by lawless hands have crucified and put to death whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it this is a man filled with the spirit he's not afraid to tell the truth That's what happens in revival. That's what happens when the Spirit sets you on fire. He goes on, For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord, Lord, always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You've made me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David that is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Messiah to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah that his soul would not be left in Hades, nor did his fleth, flesh see corruption. This Yeshua God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. And he goes on, and he, he, he keeps telling Scripture, and he keeps explaining to them, and he says, Therefore let the house of Israel know assuredly that God made this Yeshua, whom you crucified, both Adonai, which is Lord, and Messiah. Now when they heard this, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. The Spirit brings conviction. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? This is a sign of true revival. That repentance happens spontaneously. And then salvation happens. And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and your children, to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. One of the stories I read about Asbury Somebody said they were sitting there and stunned and the person next to them was singing at the top of their lungs. The person on the other side of them wasn't singing at all. And all of a sudden the person singing at the top of the lungs began to speak in tongues. And he realized that they had just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit spontaneously. The fire fell and filled on that person. And that's what happened. These people felt the fire. They felt the need to be revived And Peter says, be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized. 
And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. There were probably tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. Some say millions in the crowd that day. Well, that's okay. 3,000 were the first fruits of that day. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And then fear came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, sold their possessions and good, and divided them among all as anyone had need. This isn't a commune. This isn't a hippie thing. If you had a need, people met it. You're seeing that in, in Kentucky. People need a place to stay. They're figuring it out. So continuing daily in one accord, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That's the first great awakening for the church. That's the first great revival and evangelism that sprung. It began on Pentecost 33 A.D. and went into its final phase on Pentecost 1948 when Israel became a nation at midnight May 14th. the sign of the fig tree blossoming. The enemy knew it. They went into overdrive doing the the false signs and the things that they were doing. And the church every now and then wakes up and goes, oh, wait, did something just happen? And then they go back to sleep. Hosea 6, verses 1 and 2. Come and let us return to the Lord. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Lord, we need you to revive us. That's what the name of this... This lesson is revive us, O Lord. And the elements of the original awakening for the church are the elements that we should see in every one waiting on the Lord. Coming together in unity of purpose, mind, and spirit. A manifestation and a dispensation of of the Holy Spirit with external evidence so that others can see it and be inspired by it. The boldness to preach the gospel, the conviction of sin, which then leads to repentance, which then leads to conversion. Remember I told you in my story, I knelt down at that altar and I realized I needed a Savior. I'd thrown away everything in my life of value. I'd screwed everything up. I was broken. I needed the Lord. A divinely inspired awakening has those elements. When I heard about Asbury, I waited before I said or did anything. I began to wait to see if I saw these signs. And after reading all the stories today, I decided, you know what, I need to talk to you about this. And I'm not telling you to drive to Kentucky unless the Lord tells you to do that. So you can have it in your own home. You can have it wherever you are. Yes, I do miss the fellowship. I do miss the coming together and the the worship and those things. And I am believing the Lord's getting ready to to change that, that we can have a, a place to do that. But I do it here. I turn on the praise and worship. I don't know what the people think outside. I sing. I shout. I cry. I blow the shofar. Every now and then we need to stir it up. Boy, I hope you're getting stirred up right now. But there's a catch to all this. Red letters, the Lord says, John 3. 
Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Yeshua said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it's come from and where it goes. So is everyone born of the Spirit. People are being born of the Spirit in those, in those college campuses, in the chapels, in the auditoriums, and wherever they're meeting together right now. They, they were born of the flesh, but now they're born of the Spirit. A real person created by Almighty God in the garden, has now been awakened on Calvary. And that's how we are awakened. We don't have the body yet, but we're going to get it, and then we'll be just like Adam was. The New Testament church is born out of this awakening. 120 becomes 3,120 and then goes to 8,120, and so on and so on. And the seeds of the church just keep multiplying. Hasatan, Satan, and the fallen have taken this same program and put it together very, very well. They're planting seeds of sin and degradation and debauchery. They're planting seeds in your children and your brothers and your sisters and your husbands and your wives, planting seeds that are bearing fruit. Why aren't we doing the same? First of all, let's get some weed killer. The Lord was building temples that he could dwell in until man decided they had a better way and they wanted to build their own temples. And once that happened, once they put up their structures, their basilicas, their buildings, their their monuments to their egos and their flesh, The fire died out because the Lord said it. You don't know where it's come from. You don't know where it's going. Folks, you put up a building and you build your own ornate structure and you do everything you do. The spirit can't get through. And then another awakening was needed. You know how I feel about this, but I'm going to state it real clearly. We need to tear down those man-made temples and we need to get rid of the customs and the mannerism and the denominationalism and the rituals that have quenched the Holy Spirit. And We need to get back to the upper room. We need to get back to this flow of the Spirit. There was a Christian singer named Carmen passed away last year. I called him Paisan whenever I'd send him a text or We'd talk on the phone to, he was from New Jersey, I was from New York, two Italians that had a lot in common. He wrote a song at the beginning of his career. I wanted to play it, but even though I had permission from Carmen to use his music any time I could, any time I wanted to, he's gone and nobody I knew from his organization is still around. So I didn't want to use the music and get in trouble and have my stuff taken down. The message is more important than that. It's called Revive Us, O Lord. I'm going to read you the lyrics. We've turned from your ways. Lord, your fruit we've ceased to bear. We lack the power we once knew in our prayers that gentle voice from heaven we ceased to hear and know the fact that he has risen no longer stirs our soul revive us O Lord revive us O Lord and cleanse us from our impurities and make us holy hear our cry And revive us, O Lord. 
Though we've been unfaithful, we have never been disowned. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead compels us to his throne. Revive us, O Lord. Revive us, O Lord. Cleanse us from our impurities and make us holy and hear our cry and revive us, O Lord. Lord, I haven't been repeating my brother's lyrics. I've been, I've been praying to you right now. And for everyone that needs the flames and the embers stirred up. They need the fire to rise back up. Well, I have a great idea, Lord, and you can help me with this, Holy Spirit. Let's take everything in their life that's not of you and put it on the fire and let it burn. Let's get a good Holy Ghost bonfire going and burn up all the dross and all the distractions, and all the sins, and all the bad teaching, and all the preconceived notions, and all the things that have kept them from being who you desire them to be, every sin that besets them, that trips them up, any spiritual attachments, external or internal, fire it up, set us free, cleanse us, Lord, from our impurities, and make us holy. Begin to stir up what you're doing in Asbury every place that you can. Your church needs it. This nation needs it. Your children need it. Holy Spirit, have your way. Do whatever you want to with the people that are listening. If they say, yes, Holy Spirit, have your way with me, go right ahead. They'll give you, if you'll give him permission, if you'll give the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of the living God, permission, he will do whatever is needed for you. He'll do it gently, he'll do it lovingly, but he will change you from the inside out. And who knows, maybe the physical healing you've been looking for will come from that, the mental healing, the emotional healing. But you've got to let go of control. You've got to let go of everything that hinders that. Let him do it. Make the hearts cry, revive us, O Lord. Stir us up. Stir up our soul. In Yeshua's name I pray. Amen. Please, please listen to me, brothers and sisters. This isn't about religion. This is about relationship. And this is about you desiring the fullness of a relationship with your Abba Father and to experience a life that He desires for you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord, may Adonai, lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace, give you peace. Shalom. I'm Richard Grund. This has been The Porch on Firefall Talk Radio.